Hi guys, Liesl here. I just wanted to let you know that the Mommy Labor Nurse podcast, as you know it, is getting a huge facelift. I'm so excited. We don't have a definite launch date in mind yet, but girl, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. In the meantime, please enjoy this re-air of a fan favorite episode and stay tuned to my Instagram stories for updates on when the new and improved Mommy Labor Nurse podcast will be back with all new episodes. You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, episode number 45. Hey guys, so we are doing a, I don't even know what to call it, I guess it's an expert interview episode this week um, with my friend Marley, and Marley is at Midwife Marley on Instagram. Um, I'll talk about it in the episode, but I just, I love her little, I love her little drawings on Instagram, and I just love her. So we're Instagram buddies. <laughs> but she came on today because um, we actually did a live together a while ago. I think I was pregnant. at the t- Yeah, I was pregnant. Uh, newly pregnant. I think it was kind of newly when COVID was going on. Um, a while back, we did a live together and we chatted about the differences between UK maternity care and US maternity care. And it was such a cool live to do that we decided we wanted to do a whole podcast episode on it. So that is what's coming out today. So Marley is a registered midwife from Surrey, UK, and she's also a mother to five children, including a set of twins. She's practiced midwifery in a various amount of settings over the past 11 years, working in hospitals, birth centers, and in women's homes. She cares for women from conception up until two weeks postpartum. Like I said, she's also Midwife Marley on Instagram, and she does these these cool little cartoon drawings <laughs> that I just love. And she, like I, loves to educate moms on there in childbirth, and she's passionate about helping women to have a positive birth experience, no matter what, what type of birth they may have. So today we talked about um, her training, you know, how kind of what the difference is between a midwife, because midwives in the United States and midwives in the UK are, are a little bit different. Um, so we go over kind of her training and what sort of care she provides uh, women. We talk about home birth in the UK and the differences between home birth here in the United States and home birth in the UK. And then we talk about postpartum care and their postpartum care system, which is kind of very, very interesting to me because, again, it's very, very, very different than here. It was a super cool episode and a very enlightening episode because, yeah, it's just, it's always cool when I hear, you know, hear from other people from different countries and hear how things are in different countries. So without further ado, let's hear from Midwife Marley. You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, where we firmly believe in the power of education when it comes to giving birth. Tune in each week as we dive into pregnancy-related topics, expert interviews, and a variety of birth stories. As a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast is not medical advice. Please see mommylabornurse.com slash disclaimer for more details. And now, here's your host, educator, registered nurse, and fellow mom, Liesl Teen. Hi, Marley. Welcome to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Yeah, awesome. And you are way far away from me. (laughs) We are not in different countries. So (laughs) can you start by telling listeners a little bit about yourself and your family, where you're from, all that good stuff? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So, um, So yes, I'm Marley and I'm a midwife from the UK. I live um, just outside of London with my partner and my five children. Awesome. I've been a midwife now for about 11 years. Yeah, so about, yeah, just just over 11 years. And I've uh, worked in all areas of midwifery maternity. So I've looked after women in the antenatal period, so before they've had their babies, throughout their pregnancies, during their labour and birth, and in the postnatal or postpartum uh, period as well. Love it. So, yeah. <laughs> Love it. So you've done just a lot of different stuff. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, quick question. And I guess we didn't talk about this before um, in our live, but so you said you've been a midwife for 11 years and your oldest is, you said your oldest but, is older than that, right? So you probably yes. went through training like while you were, while you had children. 
Yes, I did. Yes, yeah, so he's 20. He's just turned 20 now. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I start, so before I become a midwife, I actually, I, I was going to be a journalist, funnily enough. Ah, and interesting. Yeah. And I did, I went to, uh, to university and I did a degree, bachelor's degree in digital broadcast media. Okay. And then I graduated when my son was, uh, how old was he? He was about two. Mm-hmm. And uh, no, about three actually. And then I said, actually, I don't want to be a journalist anymore. I want to be a midwife. <laughs> so I Isn't kind that of just, how it works? <laughs> just how it works, you know? <laughs> so fun fact, this is, I've never said this like on, I mean, my friends know this and, and my family and stuff. But um, I've never like really like talked about it. And it's, it's not that interesting. But I was totally when I first went to school before I did nursing, I wanted yeah. to be like a physics major. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, wow. Isn't that there you crazy? Go. Like I was so into science and like physics and I had a really crazy, awesome physics teacher in high school. And he just made such an impact on me that I was like, this is the coolest, you know, uh, science-y kind of like, <laughs> like, I, I just really want to do physics and I want to teach people physics or I want to like do something with, you know, like I was oh just, gosh. I don't know. It was just a really great teacher that I had. So I went to college and I started, you know, like pursuing that. And then I realized, um, yeah, Actually, no. I think I think it was just my teacher that was really cool <laughs> that I really liked. <laughs> that I started hard, exploring. Though. Yeah, that I started exploring other other uh, other things, and then yeah. I got into well, nursing. We, we all change our paths, don't we? You know, <laughs> lots of people change their paths as, as you go through life. We so. do. We do. Yeah. Well, okay. So super, that was a super side side step. <laughs> so guys, today we are doing a podcast episode with Marley and I did a live with her a couple weeks ago on my Instagram and we just kind of, um, we're both, you know, on Instagram educating people about labor and birth and pregnancy and we kind of do it in, in a little bit different ways. Marley has pretty cool little, uh, drawings that she shares that are super fun that I love. Um, and yeah, we just kind of did a live to talk about the differences between the UK, you know, UK care and US care. So I was like, Hey, Marley, do you want to just come on the podcast and we could just kind of elaborate for an hour? So yeah, that's what we're going to (laughs) do. So I have a few questions written down. Um, and the first one is, I guess you kind of, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but what sort of training did you go through initially to become a midwife in the UK? And kind of what does that look like? Does, is it all the same? Because I actually did, uh, you, uh, you probably saw maybe my post I did a few, last week where I talked about how it's very different in the United States. Midwifery care is not the same sort of training yeah. all over. So I want to yeah. know how it is in the UK and, and what, what you went through. Yeah. So in the UK, obviously we're a much smaller country. So right. the standards throughout the UK are exactly the same. You know, it doesn't right. kind of vary from state to state or anything or, or from right. county to county. It's the same throughout the country. So there's two, currently two ways of becoming a midwife at the moment. So the first way is if you're already a registered nurse, so say you, you've gone to university, you've got a bachelor's degree in nursing, mm-hmm. and or you've got a diploma in nursing. So years ago we used to do diplomas, but I think they're I think they're phasing those out now. So now you can only become a nurse if you do a bachelor's degree. But if you're already a registered nurse mm-hmm. with the Nursing and Midwifery Council, then you can do like an extended 18 month program to become uh, a midwife. Okay. If you're not a mid, if you're not sorry, if you're not a nurse. So if you've got no background in general nursing or anything, then you can still become a midwife without doing your nursing first. So it's called a, it's what we call a direct entry midwife midwifery program. So in that instance, what you'd have to do is you'd have to go to uh, university and do apply to do a bachelor's, uh, a bachelor of science. I think it would be in midwifery or pre-registration midwifery. So that that's like a three or four year course, depending on the university. Um, It's usually, usually around three years. And those are literally the two ways you can get into midwifery, you know, so either doing your extended course for 18 months, if you're, if you're a qualified nurse or direct entry, you have to do a degree and that is via university. And then what you do is you'd spend half the time at the university. Mm-hmm. I think you guys call it college over there, but it's the yeah. same it's the kind of thing. Well, yeah, we did, yeah. it, I mean, it, we call it university, but yeah, oh, we, we okay. call it, co- we call it college. Um, mm-hmm. But but we have, you know, the univer- like the University of North Carolina. But yeah, typically, like if somebody's call it, we don't call it 
university mm-hmm. in, in the same regard, I guess. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it becomes c- confusing because when we leave school, so we leave school at 16, you see, and then, ah. we, go to, and then we go to college. So we go to college between 16 and 18. Ah, yeah. Gotcha. And then from 18 onwards, then we go to university. So that's where <laughs> sometimes so, yeah, it, it becomes a little, a little confusing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's basically how, how it works. When I did my midwifery, mid- mid- we still had what we called diplomas. So okay. we had, uh, you could either do a bachelor's degree or you could do a diploma, which is, you still learn the same things, you know, yeah. uh, but it's it's a slightly lower level, I guess. Yeah. And to do that, you would be funded. So they would, the, the government used to give you a bursary, which is like, I don't know, a few, a few thousand pounds a year to, to become a midwife. But with a bachelor's degree, you I don't think you get the bursary but what you do get is you you can apply for um for like a loan instead so things are different okay. now so as, okay. as to what they used to be, but there's still yeah it's still only two ways of becoming a midwife at the moment makes sense and that's that kind of reminds me of how just general nursing is here in the mm. United States because there's a couple of different ways to get a nursing degree like a nursing degree like not talking about midwifery or anything right Um, because yeah you can still do they do still have some diploma programs here in the United States but kind of the bigger difference and the route that I took was I went to um, a community college which is basically you it's just a different degree it's like a like you like you said like a like a lower level degree um Mm -hmm. and I could you know specialize in nursing but then I could still take the same licensing test that someone could could take after going to a four-year you know like a bachelor's degree but the advantage to going to a community college is you get it done a little bit sooner. Yeah, you have a lower, um, it's like a kind of a lower degree, but it's the same license and it's mm-hmm. a lot cheaper. <laughs> so right. like if you go to a community college, it's, you know, the funding is, is a whole lot cheaper. And what I honestly did was I went that route. And then um, when I started working for the hospital that I work at, they give tuition reimbursement. So I just went back to school and did online online school until I was able to get my bachelor's and now I just have ba- my bachelor's degree so it's kind of right, okay. kind of similar ish yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so cool well awesome mm. well, let's go into the next question next one is just like what sort of care do you provide to women I, I know you kind of talked about it a little bit in the beginning but just let's just go over an overview of all the different kind of things that you do at work <laughs> so uh, as midwives like I mentioned at, at the beginning we we basically look after women from um, booking, which is like a few weeks after conception. Yeah. <laughs> when, they, when they find out they're pregnant, right through till about a couple of weeks after the birth. Okay. So that will include things like running antenatal clinics. So when they come, uh, when they have to see somebody at their, for their kind of checkups, they yeah. will come to visit the midwife. Usually around, so the first one's at booking, so that's at about nine say nine, 10 weeks. That's their first appointment. And we do like a lot of, um, load of blood tests and things like that Mm -hmm. and checks. And then, um, then the next appointment is usually about 16 weeks. And then we see them again at 25 weeks, et cetera, et cetera. And then obviously we see them a lot closer, a lot more often towards the end of the pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah. And then midwives who work in the hospital on the labor ward or in the birth suite, then, then the birth center, then they are the ones that will look after a woman throughout her pregnancy, uh, sorry, without, throughout her labour rather, her mm-hmm. labour and her birth, and then will discharge her home once she's ready to go home from the ward. Mm-hmm. And then we've got midwives who work out in the community who will then go and visit the mums at home and that will also run postnatal clinics. So we usually do a, like the first visit when they've come home from, uh, from the hospital mm-hmm. and then subsequently we get them the the women to come to a postnatal clinic where we can kind of check them over, make sure their stitches are okay. Make sure um, if they've had a cesarean section that their, that their wound is okay. Mm-hmm. And just to, to do general checks on them and the baby as well, check on breastfeeding, check on baby's weight, you know, mm-hmm. those kinds of things. So it's kind of like an all round, but what most midwives do is when we qualify, we kind of rotate around different areas. So we might spend a year working on the delivery suite. Then we do a year working on the postnatal ward and then we do mm-hmm 
a year working maybe in community and then we finally settle down into the area that we like um so what I did is I I did that I rotated around and worked in lots of different areas mm-hmm. but then in, mo- in the most recent years I've been working out in the community so I've been visiting women at home running antenatal clinics and running postnatal clinics as well so so therefore I kind of see women throughout the whole process rather than yeah just being sort of on the ward and just seeing them for that time when they come in for, for, for labour and delivery. You know, I kind yeah. of see them before and, and after. So, yeah, it's, it's quite good because we kind of get an all-round an all round view of women and what they, you know, and, the, and their journeys, as it were. Yeah. No, I love that. That's cool. Um, yeah. And that's kind of, it kind of reminds me of, res, like, in the United States, um, you know, doctor would go through medical school and then they would do like a resident residency, what's called mm-hmm. a residency. And they kind of do that where they hop around, they go to, they, you know, they usually have an idea of what kind of residency program they want to do, but they still try to mm-hmm. rotate them in different, like if somebody wanted to be an OBGYN obstetrician, mm-hmm. they would go through, um, still go through, you know, emergency department, rotation and a family doctor rotation and just kind of get all avenues until they kind of more specialize into OB. Yeah. Um, so it kind of reminds me of that. So that's cool. Well, awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go to the next question. So this one is about home birth yeah. and I know that home birth is very different in the UK than it is in the United States. Um, yeah. And just, I think a lot of people are just curious about home birth and how the standard of care is over there because I think mm-hmm. I personally think you guys do it fabulously. <laughs> um, and I think it helps that uh, obviously you, you mentioned, you know, you guys are a much smaller country, so it's mm-hmm. easier to have standards of care. But I guess I wanted to just know if you could touch on home birth in the UK or what mm-hmm. kind of are the standards of care? Um, yeah. And just kind mm-hmm. of elaborate somebody who doesn't know any, anything about home birth here in the United States. Tell us all about all about okay. kind of how it works in the UK. Sure. So I think the first the first thing to point out is that over here, um, obstetricians and midwives work very close together. There's yeah. not a kind of um, them and us or anything like that. Is you know, yeah, we, we we work very close together, and because of that, when guidelines are drawn up, so guidelines for home birth, they are done in, you know with midwives and obstetricians in conjunction with each other. So. Home births usually, it's, it's kind of two models really. So mm-hmm. the main model would be a home birth that's facilitated by the hospital midwives. So all, all midwives in the UK or the majority of midwives in the UK will work at a hospital. Mm-hmm. And a hospital that is uh, also occupied by consultant obstetricians and, and other various uh, types of obstetricians as well. Yeah. Different grades. So... As part of the hospital, we have what we call a community midwives department. So these are the midwives that, and, and I'm one of them, that mm-hmm. will then go out and, and visit the mums. They'll run clinics during the week. They'll come visit the mums at home, etc. But they also do home births. So the community midwives uh, team, they may have like a sub team of home birth midwives mm-hmm. <laughs> um, who specifically go and do home births and that's it. Or it might just be the community midwives would do the, the home birth. But they, they also, you know, they can also get called in to work in the hospital or work in any other department as well because they're employed by the hospital. Mm-hmm. So the guidelines are drawn up with, you know, with the medical team as well, or the obstetric team rather. And they would form part of what we call NICE guidelines. I don't know if you've heard of uh, NICE guidelines. It's basically, it basically stands for the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. So. Okay. In terms of obstetric care, with midwifery care, maternity care, that kind of thing, all hospitals will have to kind of follow the guidelines that, that, that NICE set out for us. Okay. And that will include home birth as well. Gotcha. So, yeah. So what would happen is, is if a mum came to us at, say, 10 weeks and said, hey, I, I want to I wanna give birth at home, then we say, okay, we have a chat about it. And what we would do is as we're booking her in, we see what, what risk factors there are, you know? So mm-hmm. um, you, you're, you're well aware that some women to have home birth might be more risky than other women, you know? So we kind right. of go through their history and we say, well, you know, according to X, Y, and Z, then you are a slightly high risk for, or you, or you don't, not the high risk, but you don't fit in with the criteria for a home birth. But 
that's not to say that you can't have one because we, it's not down to us to say to a woman, you can't give birth in your own home. Okay. Sure. It's mm-hmm. down to her to have her basically come to an informed decision herself. And it's down to us to kind of say, right, these are the risks, these are the pros, these are cons, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we don't advise it, you know, but if you want to do it, that's something we will support you with, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other hand, if somebody is totally low risk, no, uh, no previous cesarean section or no, no, no risk factors at all, and she wants to give birth at home and there's a home birth team in her area or attached to the, mid- to the midwife's office, then absolutely fine, she can go for that. And what we'd do as midwives, if we would just follow exactly the same guidelines that you would do with anybody else in, in early labor or established labor. But the only things that are different, different really is that obviously at home, you can't have an epidural. Right, you know? right. The midwives would carry around the nitrous oxide, the gas, or we, we call it gas and L, entinox, would carry that. Mm-hmm. Some, some maternity units may have certain opiate drugs as well. Um, but I think that's because that's kind of diminishing, you know, more, more and more. Yeah, um, you're getting and, kind of away <laughs> from yeah 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 but um but we we would also kind of carry out uh carry around equipment and things yeah carry on equipment and things that we need in case of an emergency so resuscitating a uh, an infant or uh, resuscitating a mum so the guidelines are pretty much set set in (laughs) set in stone as it were but you know every woman that comes through we kind of try to cater to her specific her specific needs and um, and wants really but the, but the other model that we have in the that's that with the hospital midwives but the other model we'd have is with private midwives so private midwives would work independently and they can do home births as well but again they still have to adhere to the nice guidelines they still have to follow the conduct that's set out in the nursing and midwifery council like any other midwife does Mm-hmm. And they have to have adequate insurance. So midwives gotcha. who work in the hospital, they're covered by the hospital insurance. Private midwives have to be covered by their own um, their own insurance. Ah, uh, like a malpractice insurance. Well, yeah, just just uh, yeah, basically, just like an yeah. insurance that, that covers them for if, if, in the event of any you know Something any litigation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I did have one question while you were talking. Mm. So, if I guess. If someone, come, you know, if someone, their first visit, they come in and they aren't really sure, you know, if they want to do home birth or hospital birth, mm-hmm. um, what, I guess, what do you kind of counsel them on? Do you just, do, you probably don't encourage them. I mean, would you encourage them if they were, if they check all the boxes and they are mm-hmm. super low risk, um, mm-hmm. do you guys encourage them to do home birth? Because that's, you know, generally like a safer option because they're low risk or do you still kind of say, Hey, these, this is this, and this is that, well, you know, mm-hmm. let us know by <laughs> 39 <laughs> weeks or whenever <laughs> what you yeah, want to do. I think it depends because I think, I don't think we're supposed to encourage anybody yeah. to do anything. And I think, right. you know, every midwife is different. Um, and I think it depends on what's available in the area. I okay. mean, okay. like where, where I live, we have, we have the option of, home birth or there's a birth center that's down the road from my house which is where as a midwife we would naturally refer every low risk woman just goes to the birth center that's where we refer them to so we say so the obstetric unit is next door to the birth center it's literally the building next door Mm -hmm. but we save that for the women who are high risk you know Um, and we refer everybody who's low risk will just automatically get referred to the birth center but we would say to them right you know options on where to give birth you can either give birth in the birth center or you can give birth at home and then gotcha. we just leave it as that. And then that kind of plants a seed in their head. And then if they want to get um, give birth at home, then they come back and they talk to us about it at a later date. Because sometimes at 10 weeks, 11 weeks, nobody really knows what they want to oh, do. Oh, yeah. So, no, you you know. you're like, uh, I have no clue. Especially <laughs> if this was maybe an unexpected pregnancy or, you know, exactly. it's your first pregnancy. Yeah, you, you just... Uh, yeah, I get that. Yeah. And it's well yeah. for it's 30 weeks away. Huh, I'm not exactly. going to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last yeah. thing I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So mm-hmm. one last question before we get to the next one. Um, mm-hmm. With birth centers, can you get anesthesia there? So can you, would you be able to get an epidural there? No. Okay. No, so, so that's so, just at the hospitals. Yeah. Yeah. So, gotcha. so, so if you've got a, a lot of the birth centers are actually attached to hospitals. So if somebody's in the birth center, and she's a first time gotcha. mom. And, and she and she wants an epidural. She just gets put in a wheelchair, <laughs> wheeled along to the Roll delivery down. suite, 
Off you go. (laughs) And you can have one in there. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, cool. All right. So the next one is we already, we're starting to talk about it, pain medications. Mm. So what are, I guess, yeah, I guess we've already kind of answered it, but what are some of the most popular pain medications, analgesia um, Mm -hmm. options that most moms go for that you maybe not encourage, but you, you know, give them options like this is this is what we have at mm-hmm. home. Um, this is what's available in the birth center. This is what you might have in a hospital. Yeah. So there's really three main types of of, of pain reliefs that we use yeah. here, and that's the gas and air. And everybody, well, almost everybody, goes for the gas and air. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, some women are happy just to use that throughout the whole labour and just give yeah. birth. Some women. It's kind of like a tier system, you know, so it's like we kind of step up. If somebody says, oh, I need something else, say, okay. And we talk to them about opiates. So we talk to them about some, uh, a drug with, which we call pethidine. Mm-hmm. And we obviously let them know the pros and the cons for that as mm-hmm. well. And then if they decide to have it, we give them some of that. If they decide they don't want that, then we talk to them about an epidural, which yeah. is obviously the most invasive of, of, of all right. three um, types of pain relief. Right. But if they want an epidural, then they, they can have an epidural. But it's something that they can't have at home, obviously, and they can't have in the birth centre because it needs to be given by an, an anaesthetist. But yeah. usually, usually, I would I would probably say, in my experience of being on the on the delivery suite, I would say at least ninety percent of women will all start off with the gas and air. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. But even pr- but even prior to that, I I might say to somebody, you know what, if you're at home and you're in early labour, get in the bath, use some warm water. You know that mm-hmm. that might help as well. And some women decide that they want to have a water birth and on the on the delivery suite which is the the or the obstetric led unit they actually have a, uh, a birthing pool there oh, cool. so yeah yeah so you know some women might want to get in there to begin with before they go on to to something else very rarely occasionally you have a woman who just comes in and says no I don't want anything else I just want an epidural gotcha. <laughs> that's my first my first choice and my only choice occasionally yeah. you get that but not not very often usually women will start off with the kind of um the the less invasive medications first and then kind of work their way up if need be yeah no that's that's very interesting because it's obviously Mm. we we talked about this in our live too um that it's very different in the in the united states we kind of don't don't necessarily encourage people to get labor or to get sorry to get epidurals Mm. um at least at the hospital that I work at, but it's kind of just more of, Hey, like we, we this is a hospital, you know, you do these are your mm. options. What do you want to do? You know, it's more of like that kind of question and mm-hmm. Hey, these are the pros and cons of getting an epidural. Hey, these are the pros and cons of getting IV pain medication and our hospital think we do have nitrous oxide um, mm-hmm. available, but a lot of hospitals don't, you know, don't even have the the nitrous oxide available. So I think oh, it's just right, a different wow. dialogue, okay. um, mm. in the United States, but I did want to ask you, so I, th- I feel like the nitrous and this could be me, I'm, I might be wrong. Um, but I feel like our nitrous oxide is different, a different concentration than y'all. Okay. Maybe. So tell me <laughs> what exactly gas and air is. <laughs> so it's a mixture of um nitrous oxide and oxygen okay, okay. um yeah it's it, it, it's it's a mixture. and to be honest off the top of my head i can't even remember what it is if it's 80 20 or 50 yeah. 50 i can't remember so i don't want to don't want anyone to kind of hold me to right this. um but uh it's it's laughing gas basically yeah yeah and so, i think ours yeah. is just a like less nitrous oxide. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that's all it is. Cause it's the same. Have you ever tried it? I, I Have did. Tried? I tried it during my labor and I did not like it, but you yeah. know what? Um, mm-hmm. I think there's also a difference because I think over there, your mm-hmm. mask system is different. So over here, cause I've mm-hmm. seen videos of if people giving birth um, mm-hmm. in the UK and the thing that they put in their mouth is like just a little, it's a mouthpiece. Yeah. yeah, it's just a little mouthpiece. It's not like a big face mask. No, and over gosh, here, no. over here, that's that's all we. I mean, at least that's what it is in my hospital. I don't know how it is in a mask. other hospitals. Uh, yeah, it's like a okay. just a big, almost like a non-rebreather, big oxygen mask that oh. is like very just. It. Too I didn't, Yeah, face. it's too much on your face. That's yeah. per- personally why I didn't like it. Mm. Was because mm. it was just 
like impeding my breathing. Like I was doing so well just breathing by myself. And then I tried this nitrous oxide on my face and I felt like I couldn't breathe with this like yeah. mask on my face. Oh gosh. No, the, the, the thing is with the with the mouth mouthpiece, I mean I've I've used gas and air yeah. and not for three of my births. Yeah. And and when you bite when you breathe into it, you, you can kind of you can bite onto it as well. And I think mm-hmm. it just helps kind of focus up when you're having okay. those contractions. And then you oh. take it away. You, you you take it away when the contraction's gone, you take it out of your mouth. Whereas mm-hmm. if you've got a, it's constantly there. Yeah. You know, whereas with the gas with the, with the mouthpiece, you can just take it out and put it to one side for a few minutes until the next contraction comes, and then you start breathing on it again. But I yes. found that it helped to all right, it doesn't take the pain away completely. It just makes you kind of feel a bit, you know, a bit yep. drunk. A bit um, yeah, but it it it, it kind of helped me and other women that I've, I've worked with as well to focus on breathing. You know, mm-hmm. uh, because you have to kind of breathe deep on it, don't you, to just kind of get mm-hmm. the full effect. But it's, I mean, you know, everybody's different. Some people are going to have adverse reactions to it and think, oh, no, I don't, you know, I don't want this. I'm feeling out of control. And other people are like, yeah, that's just great stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, um, everybody, everybody's different. And then if you puff on it too much, though, it can make you feel nauseous. So yeah. that's why you have to just be careful that only, only use it when you've got a contraction. Some women just like to puff on it the whole time. And it's like, yeah. no, you've got to kind of put it down for, <laughs> for a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, it can make you feel a bit you know a bit sick which you don't, yeah. you don't you don't want that yeah no absolutely all right well this next question is just mm-hmm. cu- we're kind of off topic I guess uh, now going away from pain medications but I did just want to know kind of if there's any opportunity to advance your career in midwifery in the UK because they're definitely over here so it, you know it's a little bit different if you're a, if you're a physician um mm-hmm there's different advancement opportunities, but nursing, there's definitely a lot of advancement opportunities. You can get a master's degree and you can go here and there. Um, So I wanted to know if there is, if that, you know, once you become a midwife, that's kind of the the top level (laughs) that you are in your career, or if there's any sort of like other job that people get other career that people get that's like a little bit higher than midwife or if anybody mm-hmm. goes you know if there's an easy way to go through obstetrics and go to medical school and become mm-hmm. you know a physician yeah so once you so once you qualify as a midwife and you've, you know, you've got your bachelor's degree and you you start working in the hospital you have to get a certain level of experience before you can really go on to do anything else and that's usually okay. about two two years but we have what we call specialist midwives so we have like the diabetes specialist midwife. Okay. And um, we have uh, a vulnerable woman's specialist midwife. So these are the these are the midwives that work with women who are um, have problems with substance abuse, women who have problems with domestic domestic abuse, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Women that are more vulnerable, you know. So we have one midwife assigned to all of those women. Uh, someone else who may specialize in antenatal screening for you know anomalies and that kind of thing. And these midwives who specialize. Then they are they usually paid at you know a, a higher band a higher yeah. grade um, than your uh, standard registered midwives, and there's also the opportunity to go on to become a matron or to become a consultant midwife as well. But that's still kind of working in midwifery. You just you just kind of more specialised and more focused really. Gotcha. But if you want if you want to kind of move away from midwifery, there are other other things you could do. You could become a health visitor, okay. which is basically like a pu- public health nurse. But they again, they're very kind of uh, specialised in what in what they do within the within, within the local community. They they work a lot with families who have got children under the age of five years five years old, and they kind of guide that family through through the kind of the, the early years and help them with things like weaning and development of the of the baby, mm-hmm. immunisations if that's what you know the parents want to do, mm-hmm. school development behaviour. Um, so there's there's a few ways you know a few things you can do as um, in regards to medical school, if you became a midwife, I don't think it would fast track you into medical school. You'd still have to do your I think yeah. it's about seven seven years. You know, yeah. so it might it might stand out more on on uh, your CV or your resume, but I don't think it would kind of give you any shortcuts. You know, you yeah. still have to do the same amount of training that any other doctor medical student would have to do if Makes they sense. wanted to go you know, gone to become a doctor. So yeah. Makes sense. That's kind of how it is over here too. I mean, mm. nurses typically don't, um, I guess the only difference, um, would be, I, there are definitely some nurses that I work with, um, who just, I know, and they go to nurse practitioner school and that's mm-hmm. not 
necessarily a physician, you're not going to medical school, but it's like a, you can have some of the, some, some similar roles as a physician. Like you can prescribe medications, you can, Mm -hmm. um, you know, do very, you know, you can work in clinics and see patients pr- pretty much as a, as a physician um, mm-hmm. and do a lot of roles that a physician does, but you're still seen, you know, overseen by a physician. So it's kind of the same thing. Like if somebody was a nurse for a long time, um, advanced their career in nursing, they still would kind of have to like start at the bottom to go to yeah. medical school if they wanted to yeah. like become a physician. So yeah, makes sense. Absolutely. All right. Well, this next question, we have a few more. Um, we talked about this in our live a little bit, and I really wanted to have you talk about it again and touch on it because this question is about postpartum care and how your postpartum care is set up. So I want people to know how different, because obviously a lot of these people listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse podcast are in the United States. So I want to hear how your system, your postpartum care system is set up um, okay. in, the Uni- in the UK. Okay, sure. So the moment uh, a lady leaves the hospital, the her notes will go over to the community midwife's mm-hmm. office. And if she's not from around the area, say she's given birth you know, somewhere and, and, she, and her, her home is 100 miles away. Okay. Let's, let's say she was on holiday somewhere and she happened to give birth at the hospital. Then yeah. what the hospital would do is that they would email or fa- fax over her details to the, to the closest hospital that has a maternity unit next to her where mm-hmm. she lives and would inform the community midwife that she's now gone home, she's been discharged. So, um, yeah, so the day, after, the day after she comes home from hospital, the midwife would be knocking at her door. Mm-hmm. And she would be visiting her and the baby and just checking them over to make sure they're all okay. Um, and I think a lot of it is just to kind of be that, uh, that, that friendly face, you know, yeah. and the, the mum knows that there's somebody there that she can kind of talk to if she's got any problems with anything, because we get all the normal questions like, Oh my gosh, am I feeding the baby? Okay. Is the baby right. okay? How do I bath the baby? Because we don't bath babies in the hospital. Usually yeah. you know, they, they, the, the mums do that at home. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, I mean, years ago, we used to be, send a maternity assistants around and even midwives used to go around to the mum's home and help her bath the baby for the first time because a lot of new, pa- new parents are quite nervous about that. But, mm-hmm. you know, we, we can't do that so much now. But we, we, we try to give them as much direction as possible. So we'll see them on the first day. Any problems they might have, then, you know, we kind of go over that. If somebody's had preeclampsia, for example, she might need to have her blood pressure measured every day for... I don't know, seven days or something. So we gotcha. would do that. Yeah, so we would do that as well. And then if everything's okay, we see them again on day five, but that's usually at one of the clinics and we'd get them to come to the clinic unless she's had a C-section. If she's had a C-section and, she, and she's finding it difficult to move or if she's had, you know, a nasty a perineal tear or something and then mm-hmm. she's finding it difficult to move, then we will go and visit her again at home. But where possible, we get them to come to the clinics. And then it'll be the same on day 10. You know, so we weigh the baby check the baby over um, on day five and day 10. And then we would discharge her as long as everything is okay on day 10 into the care of the health visitor okay. who will basically be assigned to that family for the next five years until the, until the baby goes to school. Gotcha. Yeah. But I mean, if there's any problems in between days one, five and 10, then we just, you know, we, we make extra, extra appointments if, if we need to, you know, you might have a mum who, who's having real problems with breastfeeding. So yeah. in which case we make get someone to come around and see her and give her some support. So it just, it just depends. Everybody's different, but yeah, it's usually, usually at least three visits. Yeah. Do. Like initially in those first. Days. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm. <laughs> very, very different than it is in the, in the United States. Yeah. So I've heard. So yeah. I've heard. Yeah. I think we're, I think mm. we're starting to understand like ACOD came out and made a statement. I, I think it was, oh. was it last year, 2018 um, that they basically said, we're not, you know, we know we're not doing this right. We know we need to see women, you know, before, because basically you get discharged from the hospital and then you don't see a provider unless you mm-hmm. have preeclampsia or you have, you know, something else, high risk, you know, a little bit going yeah. on, you would be seen at like two weeks, you know, maybe postpartum, mm-hmm. but typically it's a six week 
visit. You know, you, you mm. leave the hospital and then you don't see a provider again for six weeks. And there's not, you know, they give you numbers that you can call like, Hey, call us. If you feel like you are having postpartum depression or you're having these symptoms or whatnot. So it's not like they right. just kind of leave you hanging, but it's not that specialized. Like, okay, we're definitely going to see you at day two and day five, you know, day five, mm. and day 10. And then, so it's, yeah, just lacking. And, and we, we understand that as a country <laughs> and, uh, you mm. know, like here, but it's difficult because we, yeah, it is such a large country and we have all these different States and everybody kind of does, does things, things differently. Does yeah. things differently. So it's hard to get a really concrete standard of care, but we mm. know we're not doing it right. <laughs> and we know we yeah. need to do better. Um, <laughs> Because, I just wonder, yeah. I just wonder about the, the mums, you know, especially the ones that might not know uh, how perineum should be healing properly. Oh, and I know. And they may not get in contact with you, you know, um, unless they're kind of <laughs> in excruciating yeah. pain or something. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's hard because some some women might not know that having a fever of 38 is abnormal. Right, <laughs> you know? right, uh, exactly. So it, it's down to us to kind of make sure that, that they do know that and that, you know, that, they, that they're referred into the hospital if there's any concerns. So, right. Um, and th- those, those first few days are, are very, very difficult, aren't they? Because you oh know what gosh. it's like. You're, you're a mum and it, it's so tiring and it's like a big blur, you know? Yeah. Oh, um, for and sure. All, and all we're, th- all we're thinking about is looking after the baby. We kind of forget about ourselves sometimes. For sure. So it's good to it's good to have somebody else to be able to look after you and and, and have your best interests at heart, you know? For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so important. All right. Well, this next one is we have two more questions, guys. So this next one is just something that I heard <laughs> about UK mm-hmm. care, maternal health care. So I wanted to touch on it mm-hmm. and see kind of what you thought about it and if, if it's true or if it's not. So one negative aspect that I have heard regarding UK care. Um, maybe not just in the UK, but just like smaller European countries, is that mm-hmm. there are super long wait times, lack of supplies, or like poor cervix services, similar mm-hmm. to how it kind of is sometimes in the United States, depending on the area that you're in. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to know if you could touch on that, if that's something that is kind of true that people do tend mm-hmm. to complain about that the healthcare system is lacking in um and if there's any other kind of really big issues that maybe is not apparent um to me living in the united states that people would deal with in the uk yeah sure well there are you you obviously know how our system set up over here so we have a national health service so um the healthcare is free free to everybody which is great on one hand but then on the other hand it, it, it can become difficult if that system isn't given enough funding because then it kind of affects things like staffing levels, you know. Right. Um, if you've got uh, a midwifery training course but the government aren't funding enough midwives to be trained, then we're going to end up with lack of midwives later on, mm. et cetera. So a couple of things I think that women do complain about um, sometimes, or a lot actually, yeah. is is – clinic waiting times yes absolutely so if you have got an appointment in the in the antenatal clinic at the hospital for example and you're going in and you're going to see the doctor say you're high risk you're going to see the doctor and you've got an ultrasound scan as well you could be there for two to three hours sometimes uh, interesting yeah yeah so you know you, you could be sitting in the waiting room with 30 other women who are all kind of doing different things as well going to see different people doctors midwives sonographers uh-huh. so there there have been some issues with that um, and it's, it's just due to, due to the sheer number of women um, and not enough uh, staff, I guess. Yeah. Um, most women are happy with the labour and birth care because, again, most of the time it's one-to-one, you one midwife, one woman, right. as much as possible. But then when we go to the postpartum or postnatal ward care, unfortunately, because we have a ward with, let's say, let's say there's 12 rooms, 12, 14 rooms in a ward, so you've got potentially 12 mums mm-hmm. and 12 babies you know so that's 24 people yeah you might only have two midwives on that shift oh, you know looking yeah. after everybody they often they'll have you know a couple of maternity assistants maybe they might have a nursery nurse but it can be quite difficult when you've got lots of women who are um needing support with breastfeeding usually and mm-hmm. they're ringing the call bell and you can't get there enough and quick enough because you're, you're dealing with somebody else so a lot of the time it depends on what day you give birth it's like some days you can go in there and there's hardly any women in there and it's great because you've kind of got all the midwives to yourself mm-hmm. other times you can go in there and it's so busy 
and um actually it's probably better off if you're at home because at least you've got your family who can look after you you know right um so yeah so that's why we get a lot of women who if they're low risk and they're straightforward they ask for a six hour discharge they will literally give birth especially Mm -hmm. ones who've got children at home you know Mm -hmm. give birth they've got no tears they've got no problems they're getting up and they're walking about them they haven't had an epidural so they're up and they're walking about and they get discharged home if they want to We, we don't force this on anybody usually most women will stay in overnight but if they want to then they can go home after six hours and then we just visit them the next morning at home, you know, Um, because they feel like they've got more support at home. So, yeah, I think that with the postnatal ward care, sometimes that can be a bit of an issue. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. There's a staffing, you know? (laughs) Yeah, no, that, that makes total sense. And I mean, I would be concerned as the midwife um, Mm -hmm. taking care of these women for my own, uh, license or just uh, like Absolutely. being Absolutely. able to take care of all of these women at once. Yeah. What if one has an emergency and another person oh, has an emergency gosh. and, you know, it's just scary. You know so that's we've, why I've, we, we've been in that situation before as yeah. well. When, when we've, we've, there's been two midwives on the ward and one of the ladies, she's postpartum. So she's only given birth maybe, I don't know, eight hours before and she's just come from the ward and she's had a hemorrhage. And, yeah. we, and we've had to kind of rush her off the ward, but then we can't leave the ward because there's other women on there. Right. <laughs> so we're like, it's, hang on makes a minute, it we, need, we need somebody to come and come and help us. So that can happen sometimes, which is which is not nice, you know. No, um, no, it's and yeah. it's scary, you know, for the mm. for the healthcare professional. Um, mm. And it's kind of a, I guess, a little bit different over here because we do have. It's not st- like country staffing ratios it's based Mm -hmm. on the hospital but we Mm -hmm. do they do kind of just have standards of like hey this nurse on this certain like in the ICU Mm -hmm. um or even at my hospital in labor and delivery if somebody's in an in active labor it can you know you can only be one-to-one you can't have more than one patient in ICU you can only be one-to-one in you know the emergency department it can be three to one or in med surge it can be up to six to one or five to one Mm -hmm. it just kind of depends on the on the um on the the hospital right yeah right on the level Mm -hmm. of care and on the hospital and what their standards are so I wonder if it's is it similar over there or is it just about how many how big the hospital is and how they staff (laughs) It's, it's to be honest I think it's I think it's how big the hospital is and what the staffing yeah. is like but I, but I think it's pretty much the same across the board with most okay. big maternity units you know in the UK it's like well you know two midwives is enough <laughs> well yeah. it's, it's, I think you know the hospitals that I've worked at it's supposed to be three three midwives maybe, maybe one midwife to to six postpartum women okay um still as, gosh that's so many I, I feel like it is especially <laughs> like I said when you've got when you've got one woman who you're sitting with her for an hour trying to get help her mm-hmm. breastfeed the baby and then you've got somebody else who needs help and it's like you just can't, cannot be everywhere and you've got to do observations on all these women as well and uh, yeah and um, make, make sure they get their medication so we did the, the medic uh, the medic um medication round as well yeah um so th- th- there's a lot there's a lot <laughs> to kind no, of I, try, I try and imagine. keep up with yeah. And what are yeah. your, so over here, typically nurses, they, they do 12 hour shifts. Do you guys do 12 mm-hmm. hours over there yeah. or how do, how do your, what are your hours typically? Yeah. So most midwives in the hospitals would do what we call long days, which is 12 yeah. or 13 hour shifts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Occasionally you can split them. So you can do like mm-hmm. a seven till seven in the morning till two in the afternoon or, or yeah. one in the afternoon till 8 PM or a night shift, but it's usually sort of 12, 13 hour shifts that most of us will do. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that's how it is here. Good too. Mm. All right. Well, this last one is just the last question wrapping up. Um, I just wanted to ask you, Marley, if you had any tips mm-hmm. for any UK listeners, if I have anybody out there who's from the UK or maybe mm-hmm. they're moving to the UK and they're interested in becoming a midwife, um, kind of where where do they start? Okay, well, the first thing would be to make sure that you have the right qualifications to be able to get onto a midwifery course yeah. in, the, in, the, in the first place. So if you're a if you are kind of out of school, if you're a little bit older, for example, and you've had kids and you want to go into it, then you, if you've if you've been to college and you've got A levels or you've got um, what we call a BTEC, mm-hmm. an, an advanced one or a GMVQ in health, health and social care, for example, then that's usually enough to be able to get into university. If you haven't got that, then what you can do is something called an access to nursing course, okay, and that should be enough to then get you into university. So start off by making sure you've got the right qualifications to get into the get onto the course and then my recommendation would be to 
to do some research to begin with. Yeah. Join up at forums like there's one called, I think it's called studentmidwife.net or SMNet, I think it's called. Okay. Where literally you've got a whole, like thousands of student midwives and um, aspiring student midwives as well, all talking about everything to do with the course and from, you know, which university to go to, to what books to buy, what to write in your personal statement. But you need to do things like understanding what the role of the midwife is, because if you kind of, if you go to an interview, say you get an interview, you know, or you, you get an application form and you write down, Hey, I want to be a midwife because I like babies. Right. That is not, that's not going to get you onto the course, you know, because for <laughs> Mid- no? <laughs> mid- mid- midwifery over here is about the woman you know obviously the, right. the, baby, the baby is the end result absolutely right. Right. but the w- midwifery is about the woman and it's about her and taking her through that journey so and, and I get this all the time I, I, I get messages on, on Instagram by young girls and they say oh yeah I love babies I want to be a midwife and it's like if you love babies become a NICU nurse you know yeah. become a pediatric nurse <laughs> not a midwife oh yeah um, I can't tell you like how many yeah, we don't, I mean, we're still required, obviously, as you guys to know what, how to, how to resuscitate a baby and how to do standard mm-hmm. baby care and stuff. But like, yeah. do I sit around and hold babies all day? No, <laughs> I'm taking <laughs> care of the mom. So exactly. no, I, I completely exactly. agree. Um, I wanted to get that website for, you said it was studentmidwife.net. I think it's called, I think it's called studentmidwife.net. Okay. Or, we'll put that or, in the resource. Or, S- or SM or SMNet, okay. yeah, something like that. Um, okay. But I remember I, I I joined it many years ago, about fifteen years ago, when I when I was um, was training to, to be a midwife. So, gotcha. uh, and, I, and I found it a valuable resource for me. But it, it kind of, if you if you're ready to make your application, then you go to what's called the U- UCAS, which is the University and Colleges uh, Admission Service, and that's how you apply to become a midwife. But you need to kind of have done all your background research first. Gotcha. <laughs> um, so yeah, so definitely the studentmidwife.net forum is 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 a great place to start. That's good. That that's a really mm-hmm. good resource. Um, and then just one question while you were talking that I thought mm-hmm. of. So if you and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but if you if I am a nurse, yeah, labor deliver nurse in the United States and I move to the UK, or vice versa, if you're a midwife in the UK and you move to the United States, I wonder mm-hmm. if there's any kind of cross training that they offer? <laughs> I think I, I think there is. I think there yeah. is because we, we've had a few midwives or nurses from the US that have come over. Okay, um, I've got a feeling there might be like a little court, like a like an abridged. refresh. Yeah, yeah. Like, like a a few months or something that you gotcha. might have to do. Gotcha. But um, I don't think you'd have to do the whole program. Some it depends where you're from though, and and what standards um, they have in in that particular country, like. There are some countries in the EU, in Europe, where midwives can come straight over and start working straight away, you know. Ah. But there are some countries where it's like, sorry, you have to start from scratch. You have to, you know, mm-hmm. go to, and start trying to be a student midwife, to be a midwife from, you know, from, from, from scratch. So, yeah, it does depend where, where, you, where you go. But I think if you come from America, I'm pretty sure that it's, it, it's easy enough to kind of to kind of get yeah. into it and, transition and, and, into and, it. yeah it's trans transition into and vice versa and I bet if you have and you guys have a bat you know it's a bachelor's degree program and I would so I would think that you would not probably transition into our role as a midwife here in the United States because because a midwife and a labor and delivery nurse is different here mm. but you would you, you would absolutely be able to work as a labor and delivery nurse here probably mm-hmm. without you know any problem at all you would just probably mm. have to take our like our u.s based licensure exam but you wouldn't have to like go to mm. any, any additional schooling so but yeah it is interesting how it's just how it's just different so yeah, yeah. i think that's cool well that's <laughs> a good way crazy. to wrap up things um thank you so much for coming on can you thank just you tell people me. where they can yeah can you just tell people where they can find you because i know you know we referenced it in the beginning of the episode you we met each other on social media so if people want to yes. check out your social media tell us um tell them where they can find you absolutely so um, i'm on instagram yeah um midwife marley so at midwife marley um, and I'm also on Facebook um, under the birth coach. And I have a, a website as well, which is like a blog. So I've got some articles on there about pregnancy yeah. and birth and beyond. And that's just www.midwifemarley.com. So if you're interested, just check it out. Midwifemarley.com. Love it. And I'll mm-hmm. leave all those all those links in the 
um, resource in the show notes page for people to check out. They want to follow you. Well, thank you, Marley, Fabulous. so much for coming for on. Me. I think this was such a cool little episode that so we interesting, do. Isn't it? Yeah. Like so many differences. I mean, I, I want to talk to, I think I said at the end of our live that I want to like g- talk to different people from different countries and see how it is, you know, in Brazil or like in, yeah. you know, Germany or in, you know, this area or in China, you know, or like in, you know, a different. <laughs> this would be your mission world. now. So, I know. Right. <laughs> everywhere around the world. <laughs> you make my way. Yeah, exactly. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on again. Thank you for having me. You take care. You too. <laughs> Are you looking for birth education? Did you know that I have two fabulous birth courses that are super affordable? Well, I do. Head over to mommylabornurse.com slash podcast to take a short quiz to see which birth class is for you. When you purchase either birth course, you'll have full access to it forever. And that means it will never expire and you can access it throughout any stage of your pregnancy or for any subsequent pregnancies that you have. You'll also gain free access to my Facebook group, linked to the class where you can ask questions about your pregnancy, share your birth story after you give birth, read other people's birth stories, and get to know other members who are in the course. There is also a money back guarantee. So if you are at all unsatisfied with your purchase, please, please send me an email at hello at mommylaborers.com for a full refund. There's really no risk to signing up, and I promise you will learn a ton about what's to come when you give birth. As a listener of this podcast, you automatically get 20% off any purchase if you use the code PODCASTLISTENER. I've had tons of moms just like you enter these birth courses and have fabulous, wonderful, empowering births because they feel so much more educated about what's to happen. So if you are at all curious about birth education, again, I encourage you to go to mommylabornurse.com slash podcast and use the code podcast listener to save 20%. All right, so that is it for this episode of the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast. You probably follow me on Instagram because that's probably where you came from. But if you don't, head over to Instagram and follow me at mommy.labornurse for more. That is certainly where I am most active. I also now have a separate Instagram for just this podcast. So I encourage you to follow my second account at mommylabornurse.podcast as well if you want podcast updates. Again, that is at mommylabornurse.podcast. As always, you guys know that I also have a website where I have tons of articles all about pregnancy, birth, breastfeeding, newborn stuff, and more at www.mommylabornurse.com. I want to hear more from you on how much you love this episode of the podcast or how you think I can improve. So leave me a comment on one of my pictures, send me a DM, or send me an email with all the love. All right, guys, I will see you same time, same place next week.